Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly webinar. Today we're going to be talking about the basics of real estate syndications. And if you're new to this, uh, it will be hopefully very informative. And if you've already done syndications, it might be a repeat, but there's always new levels of learning. So <clears throat> I am uh, Kathy Fedke, co-founder of Real Wealth and also the CEO of Grow Developments. Grow Developments is our syndication department. Syndications are regulated generally by the Securities Exchange Commission um, as opposed to our brokerage, which is regulated by the Department of Real Estate. So we separated them into two different companies. Of course, uh, Real Wealth and Real Wealth Realty are the ones that most of you know about. And Grow Developments is, uh, we've been doing syndications for 14 years, but um, separated the two companies a few years ago because of the different regulations. So let's go ahead and talk about the basics. So a uh, quick disclaimer, and you've seen this before, this, uh, the strategies in this presentation may or may not apply to you. Always consult with your tax advisor, your um, attorney, if you have one, and your financial planner, uh, because this is a little bit more sophisticated investing and you want to make sure you really understand what you're getting into, which is why I'm doing this presentation. And of course, past performance is no guarantee of future results. I'm going to be sharing some of our past projects, what went well, what didn't, um, but the future is unknown. So we do our best to learn from the past and do um, and, and use that for future projects. So let's start with syndications and what it is. Well, a syndication is basically a group investment, at least a real estate syndication. It's where many investors come together to get something larger than they could do or would want to do on their own. And in, in addition to pooling money, so let's say 100 investors put 100,000 in each, and obviously they could buy something bigger, there's usually a pooling of resources. So maybe somebody with extreme um, experience in say managing multifamily or a broker or um, whatever is needed in the management team of that asset that uh, those resources are brought together in the syndication. Um, usually the way it's legally structured is um, we do ours in an LLC, uh, sometimes they're in LPs, but either way you've got the limited partners who are typically the investors, they are just investing their money and that's from a legal perspective that's what they have at stake it's um, limited liability and limited partnership there they're just investing money not time or expertise the gp is investing the time and expertise they are the general partners and they do take on the liability um, so they are in a different class and they are the ones responsible for taking taking the project to the finish line uh, it is regulated, as I said, by the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, and um, generally these types of partnerships are uh, only allowed to accredited investors. There is sort of a way to get in if you're not accredited, and I'll go over that in just a minute. So the deal structures um, generally that you'll see, and people get really confused about this, is either you're coming in as an equity partner or a debt partner in most cases. And as an equity partner, that basically means you are a partner in the project, meaning you share in the expenses and profits as outlined in the offering documents. It also means you share in the upside or downside. So it's like, the best way I can describe it is if you and me were gonna, if we found a, I don't know, let's just say a house down the road that needed some work, it looked like a really good deal. And we both say, let's do this deal. And we both go on title, Wh whoever put their money in to, for that down payment, usually in the agreement it would be, well, you get your money back before any either of us share in the profits, right? But there's also gonna be expenses, so we're gonna probably share in the cost of that, the renovation costs or um, taxes, uh, legal fees, all the things, all the fees that are involved in us buying that house together, we're gonna share those, those costs generally. Uh, and then whatever kind of profit there is at the end, you split it however you've determined you're going to split it when you go into that deal. Now, let's say that the market shifts and the property loses all of its value or like 20%, let's say, goes down 20% in value, and then the expenses went further, went were higher than expected. Well, now you have spent more 
than the value of the property in, in some cases. So when you sell that property, let's say, again, we, we spent $100,000 to buy this property, and after we're done renovating, it's worth 80,000. We've got all these expenses and debt and so forth. It may be that we both lost our money and there's no money left to pay, you know, the person who put their money, you know, the down payment down and there's no profit split. So basically the equity partnership is a partner in the whole project and has higher risk, but also the potential for higher reward. Because let's say, you know, that property that we purchased for 100,000 is now worth 200,000. Pay back all the expenses and you've got a lot to split. So it can go really well when it goes well, and it can be terrible and devastating when it doesn't because you could lose all of your capital. Um, as a debt investor, it's a, it's a little bit more secure, although nothing is 100% risk-free. So with debt, just like a bank, you're a lender and you could either be secured to that property or not, but you usually have a set interest rate and a date that that payment is due. And so usually with debt, the debt gets paid back first. Again, using this example of you and I go out and buy the property down the street, uh, it's $100,000. We get, we put 20% down, we put $20,000 down. Now we have $80,000 in debt. As you know, that debt gets paid first. Um, usually in monthly installments, you gotta, you gotta be paying it back monthly. But certainly when the project sells, uh, the bank gets paid first. So debt takes priority generally and is generally in a safer position, especially if it's secured, um, so that it's on record that, hey, we, we get our money first before anybody else. There's obviously some exceptions to that with certain liens, mechanics liens perhaps, but it has priority. Um, equity, as I said, comes after that. It's the 20% down that may or may not be at risk when that property sells. I hope that explains. Um, so the capital stack, this is just, again, a little bit further complicated of that, of what I just explained. So secured debt means that, again, a bank put down 80%. They're willing to put 80% down because they get paid first. That's why real estate's so great, because banks really see it as a safe investment if there's that equity cushion there. So they figure a property probably isn't going to go down 20% and their money is safe. So secured debt um, gets it, gets highest priority. It comes out first generally, but it also tends to have the lowest return because it's safer, um, because people feel secure with knowing that there's a collateral there. It can be a lower return, just like you could walk into a bank and just a few years ago get 2%. That's a 2% return that the bank was getting, but there was security there. Um, so they were willing to do it. Of course, now it's much higher than that. Unsecured debt is the next level of debt where maybe there isn't security, it's just a loan to the company uh, because maybe that priority loan doesn't want, or that um, secured debt doesn't maybe want another lender there. Maybe there's rules uh, around that. So there might be an unsecured uh, loan on the property. And that usually, again, takes precedence to the equity. Um, they often, they call that different things, but it could be mezzanine debt or uh, bridge debt. It's kind of what comes next. And sometimes it's secured and sometimes it's not. Um, second position, third position, position loans and so forth. Um, and in recording these liens, that's how you know that you're really safe because it's recorded. Hey, this person gets their money first, they're in first position, then second and third, whereas unsecured debt doesn't necessarily have that. Ooh, my, my screen does such weird things. So let's do that and I'll come back. All right. Um, preferred equity. Uh, so there can be several levels of that equity. So again, going back to that single family homes, it's easy to use the numbers. We buy this property together. It's $100,000. You put up the $20,000 and I'm going to do the renovations, let's say. Uh, you would obviously get your money back out of, out of the sale. You're the preferred equity partner. But um, let's say there's two of you and I bring in I bring in several partners and each one puts in $5,000 on that $20,000 deposit. Uh, it could be that, that in order to... Uh, bring in that money. Some people say, no, I want to be first out even as equity. 
um, and I want a guarantee of like 5% or 10% or whatever on my money during the time that it's tied up. That's preferred equity. So if that's written in the documents, that means that even with the equity partners, there's some that get their money back first at a certain return until that's paid off and then the um, simple equity gets theirs. So preferred equity obviously is preferred, right? <laughs> you get your money first. Um, and there's some projects that don't don't have that at all. You're just, everybody's all equity and everybody just gets their money pro rata when it comes out uh, versus preferred. So again, with secured debt, I, as I said, it's the least risky, it's tied to collateral. It's great for IRA investors if you're trying to invest in a syndication with your IRA. This could be a great one, a great one for you because you may, in your IRA, you really need to think, keep things passive. Once you start getting into more active businesses within your IRA, when your IRA invests in active things, then there could be tax on that investment. It's called unrelated business income tax. And here you've set up this IRA so you don't have to pay taxes and then you might find out later, oh no, I am paying taxes because I invested in a business. Uh, versus something passive. Now, it's pretty obvious to an IRS agent that secured debt is passive. You, you wrote a check, you invest in a project, it's a loan, that's passive. Whereas if you're an equity partner, they could argue that, especially if it's an active investment, like flipping houses or uh, building houses or, I don't know, investing in a tech company or something like that, it's active. So you could face some pretty high taxes on that. But again, debt is a great option for IRA investors. Um, and you have a set payment amount. It's like, uh, hey, this is a 10% interest rate and it's due in five years or 10 years or whatever. So you, you could kind of manage your money well because you know what you're gonna make and when you're gonna get it, hopefully. Um, the cons is it's a flat rate. It's usually lower than what the equity would get if things go well. There's no profit participation usually. The return is usually capped at what the agreement was and you generally don't have voting rights. Now, unsecured debt, like I said, it does take priority to equity investors, so that's a bonus. Still comes out of profits, so if there's no profits, your money's at risk. I mean, with anything, obviously, even if it's a loan with an interest rate, if there's, if the property sold at a loss, that's what underwater used to mean. You know, we heard a lot about underwater properties that where the value was less than the loan, that means when the property sells, you can't pay off the loan. So again, nothing is ever 100% secure. <clears throat> but with an unsecured debt, again, you still get priority to the equity when the payout comes, when the money flows. Uh, again, good for IRA investors, a set payment amount. And the cons is that it's riskier because it's not secured. It's not recorded, um, you know, as that loan taking a certain place in the in the capital stack. No, usually no profit participation, not always, but usually not. And return is capped and there's no voting rights. <coughs> Again, pref equity takes priority to the other equity. Uh, it gets participation and profit. So this is a great position to be in with equity. Um, usually a set pref amount and voting rights sometimes. Um, it's riskier than debt, often not paid until the end and no pay if there's no profits. And sometimes there's phantom income potential, meaning that if there's profits, it, in some cases where we would buy land, build houses, sell those houses, we didn't wanna have debt because debt takes priority. We didn't wanna have that. So we would just sell homes and reinvest the profits into building the next home and so forth to avoid debt. Well, the IRS sees it as, well, you sold a home and you made a profit. So even if you reinvested that, uh, you got to pay tax on it. So we have seen investors who hadn't received any money in profits yet because it comes at the end, but still having to pay tax. And that's what that means. That's why it's phantom income because you can't see it. <laughs> you don't know why you, you don't know why you're getting this tax because you didn't receive any money. But the project received money. And if you're equity, remember you're an owner. You share in expenses. You share in, in profits. And so you share in tax stuff too. So if the if the project made money because all these homes were built and sold, but then reinvested into more homes, the IRS wants to collect on the money made from those sales. Simple equity, it's a higher potential 
reward if things go well and it's a super successful project as you'll see in some of the ones i'm going to show you sky's the limit it can go amazing um, you've got full participation and profits according to the documents and the way they're set up there's no set cap on return generally although some have waterfalls that that do have caps and voting rights um, the cons again riskier it's often not paid until the end um, and there's nothing if there's no profits there's no money back to you because everybody else got paid first and then uh, phantom income potential so one of the things to look at in a structure like this is uh, i've seen this a few times in fact a project was just brought to us that we turned down because uh it, basically there's these hurdles so after investors get to a certain amount of return um, then then things flip and the operators get a bigger chunk so you just have to know you've got to read the documents really carefully in this project that was presented to us it was like 10 years down the road that investors would get anything and at that time it would flip where the operators got the bulk of it after the investors had tied up their money that whole time so be careful of these waterfalls and make sure you understand them uh, multiple entities this is this can be confusing super confusing i just spoke with someone today with so many entities it was like wow no one's gonna understand this so a single entity would be again let's just take this example we're gonna buy the house up the street we're gonna form an llc we're partners in it and it's just partners in the llc and that llc owns that piece of property uh that's pretty pretty straightforward right it might be that that piece of property we're buying is land or a multifamily or a storage unit or whatever. We just decide, we open the LLC, we decide our percentage shares and so forth based on money and time invested. And uh, there's nothing confusing about it. It's just all in one entity. And all profits, expenses, everything are in that entity. Multiple entities are where things can get confusing. And uh, so let's just say there's a, Let's do this. Let's say that we bought this, now let's say a million dollars because it'll make more sense, but we bought a million dollar property up the road. It's a multifamily, let's say, and um, and it's in an LLC, but we want to bring in a few different kinds of investors. So they are going to form their own LLCs and invest in ours. So I might have, um, you know, this fund over here, Yeah, this equity fund is investing 10 hundred thousand or what I don't know using small numbers but uh, it's, it's several different entities um, for those of you in Costa Rica you know there's so many so many and that can make it confusing we had a it's in Costa Rica so we had a US entity and the Costa Rican entity it that US entities invested in the Costa Rican entity the more entities there are and the further you are away from the actual land um, the less control you have right so with a single entity, you are in that one, and it's clear when there's more, you kind of lose touch with what's going on in the in the main entity that owns the land there, the thing that you're actually invested in. A lot of people call these fund of funds too. So somebody might have a big project, but instead of you investing in the project, you invest with somebody else who has started a fund and they invest in that project. All right, the types of syndications. There's single family rental fund. Many of you just joined our, our recent single family rental fund. Of course, multifamily, commercial, could be office, storage, retail, industrial, uh, land banking. You could just buy land together and hold it until it's worth more. Um, entitlement, this is where you take the land and you rezone it basically for a different kind of use. There could be huge profits in that. Or just you buy the land and build something. Ground up development. Uh, private lending, as I said, is also a type of syndication or fund. Uh, so diversified rental funds, you know, we, again, we just did our, we closed it out. It's no longer open for investment, but our Texas, our North Texas fund, uh, our investment strategy was to raise enough money to go out and buy homes with all cash, also use the funds to renovate those homes, thereby increasing the value of those homes putting them on the rental market. And in many cases, we overshot what we what our projections were because um, you know, the costs to renovate have come in lower and the, we got the prices lower and the rents have come in higher. So it's it's gone really well. But basically the idea is to pull the funds together, 
um, to purchase the rental properties. You either, if they need fixing, you fix them up and you hold them for a period of time. As the cash flow comes in, that is distributed to the investors based on how the splits are and how they're outlined in the in the offering documents. Uh, investors can also get, a, you know, it all flows down in the LLC to the investors. So they might also get tax benefits. Um, they get the appreciation in the end when those properties sell uh, and the cash flow along the way. Of course, all of that has to be outlined in the in the paperwork because what if the people running the fund say, you know, oh, actually we want the tax benefits. We're going to keep those. You don't get them. That all has to be spelled out. But generally it flows through to everybody based on the amount of money you invested. Uh, a flip fund would be where you're, same thing, raising the money and then going out and buying properties and then selling them. You have to remember in a flip fund, that is more active. That's an active business. Whereas a buy and hold, um, just by the sound of it, it's more passive. You're just buying the investment property and holding it. Uh, flipping is active. It's like building homes. You're just fixing them up and selling them. So you're going to have a different kind of tax implication for that. So, but either way, um, risk is diversified. If you're doing 10 flips versus one, you know, the chances are that it'll go better if you've got a good operator. And same thing with buy and hold. If we just, we bought, I don't know, 50 properties last year in our, in our fund and, you know, a few of those could not go as planned. Uh, it's not going to affect you as much as if you buy one and it doesn't go as planned, that's going to really affect you. So diversified rental funds, rental funds give you that diversification. So you're not putting all your money in just one property. It's spread out um, both geographically and um, just with different properties and tenants and so forth. A uh, risk mitigation is really understanding the market to estimate property values, rent, and appreciation during the time that you're holding it. And um, and obviously you need an extremely good property management company for any any time you're holding any property. That's the key to success. Uh, so experienced management and um, good reporting to investors. Um, this is the fund that we did before the Texas fund. Uh, it was called Turnkey, and we bought, we did sort of an experiment where we bought a bunch of properties in the Midwest that were higher cash flow. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. Take a quick sip. Um, and then we offset that with higher priced properties in Florida that were brand new and really in the path of progress that we thought would appreciate. So if we only did the Florida properties, it would be hard to keep the fund going because we needed the cash flow. Uh, but we, we decided to sort of spread it out that way. Um, we ended up with about an 8% return. We were shooting for 12%. So I was a little disappointed in that, but it really came down to the properties we bought in Detroit. Um, unfortunately, what we learned is that with older properties, they just need, they have more maintenance. So in order to sell those last Detroit properties, there was a lot of deferred maintenance we had to deal with and it became expensive. So we learned a lot from that. We made the most on the Florida properties, but again, we needed to have the cash flow to kind of keep the fund running. And that's why we bought those. So, you know, it's just important to know when you buy older properties, and I, I do mean quite a bit older and in, in climates like, like, you know, cold wintry climates, there can be more maintenance and you've got to factor in those, those costs. Plus, we sold when uh, it was just kind of a downtime in Detroit. So had I done that differently, I probably would have stuck with Ohio or some of the other markets that were in Detroit could be a challenge. Still got 8%, though. Our current fund, we were way on target for the 8%. We got all the appreciation we were expecting over the five to seven year life of that fund. We got it all in year one because we got such good deals. My partner, Leah, who many of you know um, in Dallas, she just got really ridiculously good deals. And it was during a time when the competition was gone. So we were able to buy properties with some distress and fix them up and create a lot of equity there. The amount of equity we expected to create over seven years. So that that's on target to, to do very well. All right, private lending. Um, again, I, you guys would know what this is, but we're closing this one out right now. 
Um, there's a, a commercial office building in Dublin, California, Challenge Dairy. We have uh, we raised money for a loan on that. Um, so it's called Bates Stringer Challenger. The investor is getting nine and a half percent return. That's so it's like a fixed rate, six year term. It's cumulative in the sense that um, they're getting paid currently from the cash flow, which is lower. But once we sell, they get the difference. So that difference is cumulative. So that's going to work out well for them. Uh, paid again from cash flow and remainder paid upon sale. Land entitlement. Some of you are involved in our most recent land entitlement project. Basically, what that means is, like I said, changing zoning, getting permission to use the land uh, from from the city council. Uh, it's so the investment strategy is to purchase or option the land, work with the regulatory bodies to approve the rezoning, and sell to a developer or develop it yourself, depending on what your plan is. Risk mitigation. Uh, it it is the, probably the riskiest of all types of asset classes because you're completely dependent on the approval of a board, you know, of of the city planning commission and, and the city planners. So you are at their mercy. So before ever going into a land entitlement deal, you'd already want their okay. You'd want them to want this project and be behind you. Even then you're not 100% because they may get voted out and somebody new comes in who maybe doesn't want it or doesn't want the growth or wants something different. So um, it's the it's the asset class where you have the less least control. So there's higher risk, and that's why you really want to go into it with agreement already that the city council wants it. You also got to understand the market and estimate what the property's worth is going to be once it's rezoned, and have those conversations. So ideally, you already have an end buyer who's ready to go once you get it rezoned. And need you know need lots of experience because you're really dealing with politicians and um, you know angry angry residents. Sometimes they may not want what you've got. They've got power. But some of the past entitlement projects we've done have just been amazing. Uh, this was with Fred and Scott Stringer, Fred Bates and Scott Stringer, 2013 Dublin Crossings. There was an old office building um, that we got in contract for 10 million dollars, but we only had to put up a 1.2 million dollar option for two to th two years with a one year extension. And in that time, we just needed to rezone that office to residential, but we already knew that the city wanted it because they were doing a completely new downtown plan and they wanted that. So uh, the city was behind us. Once that was rezoned, um, and there were certainly challenges, which I'll talk about in a minute, but um, it still got through it. Was it we were able to re-entitle it and create finished lots for builders? Uh, Pulte Homes ended up buying it for 20 million. So remember, we tied it up for 10 million, only had to put 1.2 million down, and sold it um, two and a half, three years later for 20 million. So it was a really, really big return. I'm going to say an average of 32% IRR, but some people made even more than that, depending on when they put their money in. So again, these can be home runs, and that's per year, that return. <laughs> um, you know, they can be just incredible, but they're, like I said, they're also risky. You need a very experienced team in place for that. Okay. Uh, also, we did Pleasant Hill, uh, bought an industrial building, same thing, um, optioned it, re-entitled the land for residential, torn down the existing building, finished out the lots, sold to a national builder. I can't remember if that was Pulte or not, but investors made a little bit lower of a return than we were hoping for. And that was because, again, it's it's just risky. In order to get the entitlements, the city kept asking for more and more and more things. That's that's how they get things done. So right when we were ready to close and sell, the city came back and said, oh, wait, well, you need to put traffic lights here and roads here and this and that and lights. And so it uh, it ended up costing us more to get the entitlements and investors got a 12% annual return. Still good, but for the risk involved with entitlement, we would have liked it to be higher. Land development. Okay, this can be also very risky because the, the, the dream is not there yet. It's beautiful. The rendering is on paper. You know what it's going to look like. Actually getting it built is a whole nother thing. So the investment strategy, of course, with 
development is optioning or purchasing land, entitling it for the specific use, getting financing. This is a key. It, without financing, the project will be dead in the water, which we're seeing right now all over the place. Uh, once rates, rates went up, um, it just it doesn't pencil anymore. So you've got projects. I mean, right now could be a good time to acquire land because developers are in big trouble. They went through the whole process of purchasing or entitling and maybe even getting the, you know, some of the horizontal construction in, meaning the utilities, the roads and so forth, but they cannot make the numbers work with today's rates to actually build the structures. So tough, tough time for developers. Having that financing in place is the differentiator for sure. Um, and then be able to sell to an end buyer, of course. So again, have that financing in place, have an experienced team, entitlements done, and supply versus demand. Um, on the, our current syndication with Klamath Falls in Oregon, we don't have that, we don't have these risks. We don't need the financing. We're just, as we said, we're building as we go, taking the profits, reinvesting. That means there would be phantom income. But the other side of that is you have to pay your taxes now instead of later. But you also uh, don't have to worry about financing. And if things slow down, you're not stuck with a loan that you have to pay. It's very difficult. If your project doesn't go as planned, the construction lender doesn't care. You know, they, they want their payments. If COVID happens and the whole world shuts down, the construction lender wants their payments. So it's been an extremely difficult time, um, certainly during a pandemic, to be in, in land development. Again, <clears throat> you're shut down for six months, a year, but the bank wants their payment and you don't have the cash flow for that. And then of course, um, supply and demand. Uh, it's really hard to do land development because it takes years to get it done and you don't know where the world's gonna be in a few years. Of course, that's with any investment. You have no idea. All you can do is your best effort seeing what kind of demand seems to be there. Are there new businesses coming in? Is there expansion? Are there new freeways? Um, airports, you know, hospitals, like what are we seeing in terms of growth that would cause the demand that we need? <clears throat> Whoops. So just an example of a past land development project. Uh, many of you were in Argos. This is where we bought uh, 100 acres, 15 minutes south of Reno. By the way, Reno looks like it's going to get hit really hard this weekend, like six feet of snow. Part of me wants to be there and the other part is like, that's okay. I don't know how I would ski on six feet of powder, but anyway, um, uh, with this particular one, our plan was to sell half the lot. So we, we bought the land all cash. We raised enough money to buy the land all cash and build the first model homes. And then our plan was to sell off half the lots to then start paying, you know, either paying for development or paying investors back. So we did, we bought, um, we sold half the lots. We actually, instead of selling it to someone else, we created a new entity, new investors and a new project called Quest. But that's just one way to kind of get through a project. Once you entitle it, the value has gone up and maybe you sell off some lots to, to get uh, the cash flow, to get, not the cash flow, but to uh, bring money in to get the construction done. Um, our current ones, this is Prescott Ranch in Bozeman. These are beautiful homes up there um, that this project is doing better than expected. I can't remember if this one or Little Lane, I think it's, I can't remember which project. I need to look it up. But on one of them, the city kind of encroached a bit with their school plans. And instead of fighting them and saying, hey, you're on our property, we said, well, you can, we're going to allow this if you give us more lots if we're able to develop more. So we ended up getting more lots, which dramatically increases the value because of a little mistake of the city. So <clears throat> I'm sure you guys know which project that is. But um, And then this one is our newest one. This one is really interesting because it has el we've eliminated some of the biggest risk, and that is the land. Um, normally on a project, this this project's in Klamath Falls, but normally we'd find a good deal and we'd either do an option on it. Like I said, you have to put up money for the option or um, buy the whole land and then develop that land, meaning you've got to bring in water, electric, you've got to bring in the roads and the hookups and so that a, a builder can build a house there. Everything needs to be ready to go. 
that is extremely expen expensive to bring on a finished lot that's ready to build. It can be in this area, 100 to $120,000 for one lot to, to do that, especially in a rural place like this, because you have to put down so much more if, if they're one acre lots, that's very different from you know a quarter lot where now you've got to stretch the utilities much further, the electrical lines and the sewer lines and everything. There's just more of it in a rural setting. So it's just more expensive unless you're doing septic. So um, in this, you know, both Fred, my partner, and I are not really interested in risk at this stage in life. Uh, Rich, my husband just had his 60th birthday and we're just like, no, we don't, we're not, we're at that age in life where we don't want risk. So we love this project because a lot of that risk has been eliminated. Um, Fred was able to, well, because of that Reno project that I showed you earlier, it won a bunch of awards. It won design awards in Reno and um, forget who gave him the award, but it was a big deal for our, our homes up there. And so somebody from Klamath Falls noticed that and gave Fred a call and said, we are in need of housing. Um, can you come up here and look at land and, and bring on new supply? So that already a good sign. Here's a city council that wants new homes, which is pretty much everywhere in the country. Every Everybody's in need of new housing. It's very much in short supply. So he went up there and looked around and there was some raw land. Again, so risky. You got to buy the land and it takes years to develop it to get to a point where you can build a house. Uh, and then he looked at other lots that were 100, 120,000 for the lot. But then he found this, which was already entitled and developed land with lots ready to build from a farmer who had bought the land in the downturn, got it very cheap, thought he could do it, but he's a farmer and doesn't have the time and energy to do it. But he's already done the development side. So Fred was able to work out a deal like, look, we'll come in, we'll build the model homes, we've got our sales teams in place, we will sell this out, but we don't want to pay for the land until the end. So he was able to get an option on this land. We don't have to take any of that developer risk. It's already done. Um, and we can build the homes and sell them and we don't have to pay for the land until the new buyer comes in and it's done at the closing table. So really great project. Um, as a result of that, we're able to give a uh, preferred return of 12.5%. So I usually do high preferred returns on um, investments like this because it's an incentive for us to get it done. So if the project takes longer, the investors continue to keep getting their 12.5% per year before we get any profit. So the longer it goes, the less profit that Fred and I make. So I like having the higher pref in place because it motivates the builder to get moving. And sometimes things are out of our control like COVID that really worked against us because it did get delayed several years and our profits were gone. Uh, but the investors still accumulated their pref, which again is 12.5%. So if you are interested in that, you can go to growdevelopments.com. You do need to be accredited to invest, but that is, uh, as Fred puts it, his best negotiation ever on uh, on this deal. Because the other thing is, the negotiation is he, we're getting these lots for $60,000, which is about half of what it costs to, to build them and to get the infrastructure in. So right off the bat, we're getting a great deal, like 50% off of, of the lot value. And we don't even have to pay for it until the end. So great deal. Again, if you want to find out, it's growdevelopments.com for more information. That's just open till, I think the deadline is March something. Who can invest? So let's go over what an accredited investor is. The SEC definition is you either earn $200,000 income as an individual over the last two years or $300,000 if you're married, or these are all ors, you don't have to meet all of these, or you have a million dollar net worth excluding your primary residence. So it could be in stocks, investments, syndications, real estate, whatever, just not your primary. Or you can have a securities license and you can, you can look that up, just Google SEC accredited investor and it'll tell you what license you need. There's several ways that different syndicators will structure deals. One is a 506C and one is a 506B. The 506B is the original um, 
regulation that allowed companies to raise money from investors. The In the past, the only way you could raise money for your project was to friends and family. And again, it's this rule 506B. So the, the deal was you had to know them, have a prior existing relationship, know their financial situation. Um, they, the investor had to prove they understand the project and the ability to invest in it and they have enough reserves and they, if they lost their money in the project, they'd be fine, you know? Um, so that's, that was how it always was. And in that rule 506B, the SEC would let, uh, would let the fund managers have 35 non-accredited, so sophisticated investors, meaning you maybe don't meet the criteria, you don't have a million dollar net worth, maybe you're close, um, or you don't make the 300,000 a year as a married couple, but you're close, um, and you could prove that you really understand, you answer questions and show that you understand it's not your last dollar, you're not putting all your money in the one deal, you have to be able to lose it. That's the way the SEC looks like looks at these. If you can't afford to lose your money in a syndication, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, they don't say that about the stock market, right? <laughs> anyway, it's with, with syndications, that's the rule. So then in 2012 with the Jobs Act, if you recall, this was an effort to stimulate the US economy after the Great Recession. And they came out with this new rule, uh, Rule 506C, that I often think of C for crowdfunding, because that's sort of when crowdfunding started. So Rule 506C was brand new. And it allowed companies and real estate deal makers uh, allow anyone in. You don't have to have that. For, it's not just friends and family. You can have anyone come in, people you don't even know. But the catch is they have to be accredited. And there has to be proof that they're accredited. So a third party has to verify. That can be a CPA, a financial planner, or you can go to verifyinvestor.com and they give you a certificate. It's just You just show some documentation. Um, but that's the rule on this crowdfunding 506C. Anyone can be a part of it. I can talk about it here. I don't know who's here today, but it doesn't matter because as long as you're accredited, you can invest with us. Um, don't need the prior existing relationship. And, and that means you can advertise. So that's why you see a lot all over Facebook. Hopefully people with the 506B weren't advertising on Facebook or anywhere else because you have to have to be a 506C to do that. Um, so what you should expect so that you know what you're getting into is the offering, the legal offering documents describing everything in detail. It's a legally, the operating agreement is the operating agreement for your company, your LLC, your limited liability company that you're building together. So with the operating agreement, Again, it's legally binding and it outlines all the terms of the company. So definitely legal stuff. I have my attorneys figure it out because it's it's legal. Uh, you know, it's just like having a will or, tr you know, a trust, I should say. You should have a trust because there are things you might not have thought about that could make life really difficult in a, you know, if things don't go as planned or with surprises. So with the operating agreement, it's like who's got the voting rights? Who's making the decisions? Who's running the project? What do the investors get? When do they get it? How does the money flow? Um, wh what kind of expenses are involved? Who pays for those expenses? These are all things you just might not think about, but it's got to be outlined super clearly in that operating agreement. And if there's any vagueness, and I've learned this lesson over and over, if there's any vagueness in the operating agreement, you don't have a legal standing. In other words, if, if, if there's a section on fees and it says we're going to cover expenses, well, what, what does that mean? What expenses? You know, our, your office, your whole staff, your receptionist, your travel, your private jet. Like, what exactly are those expenses? So that really needs to be outlined. Because we found in the past we were paying for somebody's private jet, and I wasn't too happy about that. It had nothing to do with the project. So, um, but there's no argument, right? Because it wasn't clarified. So um, I've seen people take salaries when the salary wasn't listed in the operating agreement. That's a no-no. If 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 an op if if the operator of or the manager is getting a salary, it, ha it all has to be disclosed. 
if the manager is getting fees or referral fees or commissions because they were the broker on the deal, anytime anyone within the entity is making money, it has to be disclosed and the investors know about it. This is where, again, it's worth it to bring it to an attorney who can point these things out to you. Um, private placement memorandum, same thing, legal document that states the objective, here's what we're trying to do, here's our business plan, here's the budget for that business plan, here's how much we're planning on spending on these different things, so that if they don't, if they end up doing something else, you can say this, they didn't follow the business plan, and you have some kind of a argument, otherwise you don't. If it's super vague, they can do what they want. Um, it should outline the risks and terms of the investment. Um, financial statements, boy, when you go through those financial statements, you can find all kinds of things, so you should definitely be able to see those. Uh, management biographies, you want to really know their background and what their specific role has been in past projects. We've seen this a lot where somebody, you know, said they did all these projects, but it turns out, you know, they weren't really managing it or they weren't that, someone else was doing the work. So doesn't hurt to find out specifically, you know, what was your role? What did you do in these past projects? And, and how are you going to be able to bring that into this one? If somebody doesn't have a successful track record doing what they say they're going to do in this business plan, don't do it. I can honestly say this is such a rookie move. I've done it. I have like little things, like one of the first syndications I did, like maybe the third was absolutely failed because the partner I was working with had his experience was flipping homes and we were buying uh, foreclosed subdivisions. Very, very different, very different. So even though it's like, wait, you're taking a house and you're renovating it and selling it. Yes, that's the same, but, whoop, sorry. Uh, but really the management biography should match what they've done in the past, should match what they're doing now if you want the lowest risk. Now, sometimes the manager is trying something brand new and they have huge success and everybody wins and that's great. It's beginner's luck. <laughs> but otherwise, um, generally you want to see a long track record. Okay, um, and then you also have a subscription agreement. It's basically an application by you as the investor to join the syndication because maybe the operator doesn't want you in it. Maybe um, for whatever reason. Uh, you have to apply and you get approved, meaning that the manager, managing member will review, make sure that you are qualified for the investment based on the SEC requirements. So the investor fills out the form documenting their suitability for the investment in the par partnership. That's the syndication paperwork. So you're not in until that's signed off. All right, tax time. Once you build a portfolio of private placement investments, your days of filing your complete tax return by April 15th are over, <laughs> okay? I really do want to emphasize this is usually sophisticated, high net worth investors don't file it on April 15th, and I'm super generalizing here, but it tends to be true. Uh, when you're involved in a lot of big deals, it, 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 the paperwork is just not going to be ready by April 15th, and, and um, it's usually September. So I all tell everyone, just plan on filing an extension or you're going to drive yourself crazy because you might get your K-1 too late to be able to file in April. But I do want to say again that most sophisticated investors I know would never file on April 15th anyway. Your chance of getting audited are much is much much lower if you if you file an extension. Um, they just kind of go after all the early returns, right? So um, nothing wrong with filing later. You still have to pay your taxes on time. You know you still have to pay them in April and have an idea what it's going to be. But um, you don't actually have to file your return until October. We we haven't filed in April. I can't remember. I mean it's been 30 years probably. So just know that's probably a better way to go about it so you don't lose your mind waiting for the K-1. Uh, these tax returns are more logistically complicated. It's just not simple like stocks and bonds. There's a lot of moving pieces and it just takes a while. And many operators do not have all the information they need to file by April. So again, expect delays. In most cases, inv investors can expect a tax form for their investment, a K-1. 
and projects in other states may require you to file taxes in those states, depending on the project. Always speak with your CPA in advance to understand that. And to understand what will be required of you, read the tax section of the PPM and operating agreement and definitely hand it to your CPA so they understand it and they can tell you if it's right for you and where you're using money. If you're using IRA money or at home equity or cash, whatever, um, you know, they'll, they'll be able to tell you what the tax consequences could be of that. So after you invest, um, you should be getting regular updates quarterly uh, by email or in your portal, you log into your investor portal, uh, especially if you missed an update. In, in our case, I like to do everything together. Like last night, we had a, a webinar on Little Lane. I've always felt this way. I don't like doing one-on-one -on -one investor calls because our investors are so smart. They ask such good questions. I want everybody to benefit. So I'd rather do a webinar where that question can be heard by everyone and, and uh, the answer can be heard. So we do that with updates too, if things are <clears throat> going differently than planned. At uh, Grow Developments, we have Ann Triplett. She's been a longtime investor and employee of Real Wealth and now Grow Developments. She can help you with the paperwork as can Kathy McBride. She's also been here for so long and all sorts. They've both been in different positions at Real Wealth. So you probably know their names and they can help you with the paperwork. Uh, it's um, There's a, a lot to it when it's your first time and they can walk you through that. So again, uh, Ridgewater is open. It's the only one we have open right now, 12.5% preferred return. That's annualized. Um, you don't get it right away, but we do expect and anticipate that because we don't have to develop the land, we just get to build houses and sell them. Uh, we expect to build the first five, I think it's five models um, this spring and start selling and uh, returning, beginning to return capital by the end of the year. So it's one of our fastest projects. Once your capital is paid back, it's just profits after that uh, for five to seven years. But the aim is to get your capital back as soon as possible through the sale of homes because we don't have to pay a loan and we don't have to pay, you know, for the, all the land up front. So that's, it's probably the fastest we will be, we've ever been able to return capital. That's an exciting part. Plus the 12.5% preferred return plus uh, par profit participation at the back end. So we're, we're excited about this deal. And with Fred, who I've done 14 successful projects with. So he's got 40 years experience and I think it's a, a great place to start if you're accredited. All right, let's 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 see about questions. Do we always only allow accredited investors? It's such a good question. We used to only do 506B. Then when C came out, um, you know, we were just advised that it would be safer for us because we have such a large network that if I inadvertently or accidentally let in somebody that I didn't have the existing relationship with or didn't realize. I mean, we have it all documented. So, um, but our legal counsel really suggested that 506C would be the safest for us because, um, you know, it only allows accredited investors. But that that's not to say I wouldn't be open to doing a 506B in the future. But again, you can only have 35 non-accredited in that. Um, so what we're trying to do at Real Wealth is help more and more people become accredited. And that is through acquiring real estate that grows in value. And, you know, you buy four properties that go up in value might just get you over the line into accredited status. All right. Well, that seems to be the only question. Uh, got another one. If we're a married couple, but only the husband has income, can he be accredited? No, I don't think so. Unfortunately, you'd have to. Yeah. You have to be separated. <laughs> Don't get any ideas. Um, it's it's for married couples. Uh, but you know maybe you can go with the net worth and find find a way to do that. Sometimes it can be your business valuation. Um, you know obviously equity and properties, except your primary. Um, what are some of the creative ways? A lot of times people will take the equity out of their home and put it in a bank account and let it season for three months in a, in a um, uh, equity line or something that I believe counts, but our, our team would be able to help you with that. 
Um, do most syndicators verify for you? I think some do. You can go to verifyinvestor.com. We don't because our margins, I just try to keep the fees down. So if we're paying whatever it is, $50 for the accreditation, really you're paying for it in the end because it's coming out of the fees. So we could, but we don't. Um, we just try to keep the fees down as much as possible. All right, well, thank you all. I hope I answered questions. Um, you know, syndications can be really successful. They can also be really risky. And we've had, we've had some we've knocked out of the park and we've had some that we're still struggling with um, from, from the past. Uh, so I've learned a lot over the past 14 years and definitely know what to look for and how to, how to protect ourselves. Again, I'm not getting any younger. I want to keep life simple. All right. Thank you all for joining me here. And, uh, if you have more questions, just feel free to reach out. Oh, and you, again, you can go to growdevelopments.com to find out about Klamath Falls. Someone just asked that. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.